this week on the Backtable podcast. I have the fortune to be to have been the first person in the world testing augmented reality for the guidance of ablations. And it is fascinating, Steve. It allows to, to reach targets, uh, even in difficult locations, very easily. Also by people with a very, very limited experience. Welcome to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things endovascular and interventional. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. For more than 70 years, Varian has been at the forefront of the fight against cancer, enabling advances in oncology and the quest for better patient outcomes. Now with Varian and Seaman Health and Ears as one, they're raising the standard in interventional patient care. Their solutions enable more precision and efficiency, and their commitment to funding research helps build the scientific data necessary to drive the adoption of minimally invasive image-guided procedures. Now, back to the episode. I'm Stephen Raymond from UCLA in Los Angeles, and I have the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Gigi Solbiati, a true pioneer in interventional oncology, who is often credited with starting everything practically ablation related in our field. So I invite you to sit back and, and enjoy this, this conversation with Dr. Solbiati about his long and illustrious career and how he came to this realization. So. Gigi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And thanks uh, for inviting me to this uh, important talk. Um, I'm very, I'm very glad uh, because uh, I had a long career, as you said. My career is not far from finishing because of my age, but uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here today. So for those who aren't familiar with you and in a long career, Nearly everybody is familiar with you, but for those listeners on this podcast who aren't familiar with you, please tell us about yourself, your training, and how you got interested in treating cancers and other things. So, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting talk uh, where I will summarize my career, my long career. I was born in Busto, Sizio, a small town 25 kilometers far from Milan, near Malpensa Airport. And I graduated at the University of Milan in 1977. It means that uh, now I am 70, unfortunately for me. Uh, I had my residency and fellowship at, in radiology at the University of Milan, where I got my postgraduate degree in radiology in 1981. In the meantime, I was uh, attending also the general hospital of my town, of Busta Sizio, where there were two excellent departments, the Department of Radiology and the Department of Pathology. By the way, I'm also son of a radiologist. During my, uh, my second year of residency in Milan, I asked to attend particularly the sections of ultrasound and CT because uh, in uh, my hospital, Busto, C ultrasound and CT were just uh, coming, uh, one of the first centers in, in Italy. For this reason, I was asked also to spend a period of internship at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London, where the Department of Ultrasound was led by Professor David Cosgrove, a prestigious teacher, and who became also subsequently also one of my friends. And also I attended the Department of Ultrasound of Bristol Hospital, uh, led by one of the pioneers of Doppler Ultrasound, Professor Woodcock. Occasionally, while I was at the Marsden, a, a Japanese author published an article that demonstrated the possibility to visualize uh, enlarged parathyroid glands in the neck with ultrasound. And this event was particularly important for all the rest of my career, an, an unusual uh, aspect of my career, but I'd like to mention that. Uh, you asked me how I, I developed an, an interest in, 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 uh, in cancer. Uh, first of all, because uh, in the 70s and the 80s, the, mm, the School of Radiology of Milan University was located exactly at the National Cancer Institute. And uh, malignancies were the most frequent, uh, uh, frequently studied uh, diseases. Secondly, mm, at Busto Hospital, uh, the, the Department of Oncology was very active, and the Department of Pathology was led by a man who was very 
important and famous at that time in Italy, Professor Carlo Ravetto, who was the author of the first Italian book of cytology. Uh, he mentioned himself as Mr. One Cell because he was able to make diagnosis based on a very limited number of cells. Uh, he was also a, 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 a man who studied in, in Stockholm in, at the Karolinska Hospital with Professor Franzen, the real pioneer of cytology. And so uh, we met at Busto uh, when he saw me uh, um, studying patients uh, with the first real-time ultrasound machine. He, who was used to puncture for cytology only palpable lesions, asked me to guide him to biopsy non-palpable lesions. Uh, he did not even, even look at the ultrasound machine screen during the, the, our punctures. For this reason, we had, in, in just two or three years, we developed one of the largest groups of cases in the world of uh, finite respiration biopsies of liver and abdominal lesions guided by sonography, even though we were in a relatively small and not so famous uh, hospital. That's amazing. That's amazing. It just goes to show how, you know, anything can be done in anywhere with the right individuals and the sort of the ability to sort of start something new and think in new ways. I think that is, that is, that is an incredible example of that. So when you applied these skills, what skills do you think were the most important? Like what skill set? obviously you didn't train in to do this. How did you apply these skill sets to these, these new areas? So uh, I, I dedicated a, a long time trying to learn as much as possible from the possibility of sonography at that time, because sonography, as you know, Steve, was, uh, was and still is probably the most uh, indicated guidance modality when a lesion is visible with ultrasound. And I try to push as much as possible the use of uh, sonography to guide, to try to guide the needles into small lesions, uh, partial invisible lesions, and so on. This was probably the key for my, for my initial career. So the, uh, the uh, idea to treat, to, uh, treat tumors percutaneously uh, using ultrasound as image guidance was connected to this skill, particularly in ultrasound at the beginning of my career. That's amazing. You know, I tell all my trainees and my fellows how important this skill is, especially in interventional radiology. But I, in the United States, ultrasound is, it's variably taught and considered. Uh, and that, so I think this is a very important lesson that it's uh, still a very important skill and maybe the best ultrasound interventional skill to have. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, in, you know, in, in most parts of the world, ultrasound is performed personally by medical doctors. In some countries like US, it's not. And this creates well, some problems sometimes in using ultrasound if you are not extremely familiar with sonography. Yeah, I, I completely agreed. And so this is a very important lesson, at least for the Americans who are listening to the podcast. So when you decided to treat the first parathyroid adenoma, can you explain a little bit about how that actually came to be? Did you you know, you, you mentioned that this was in reaction to a, a prior Japanese author who had suggested this. Just explain a little bit about how that actually happened. I mean, did you have to get special permission? Why, you know, what, what circumstances were there that led you to be, you know, in this sort of small thing that started off a big revolution? Yeah. Uh, and uh, as sometimes it occurs, uh, it was uh, almost occasional <laughs> because uh, uh, you, you, I have already mentioned the, the experience of the Japanese author who described the possibility to, to see a parathyroid tumors in the neck. One day, uh, when, when I was back from UK uh, and I uh, m reported that in, in London, uh, I studied many parathyroid tumors starting from the Japanese uh, uh, paper. They asked me to go on studying uh, parathyroid tumors in uremic patients. And one day uh, we had to perform a, um, a biopsy in a large mass of the neck of this patient who was not uh, in very good conditions, physical, was in very bad physical conditions. And he had this uh, large mass, which seemed to be a parathyroid tumor, but we are not completely sure. 
We performed a biopsy, and just uh, two or three days after that, uh, uh, the clinician following this patient uh, called me and said, what have you done to my patient? I said, biopsy, why? Uh, because uh, the, the, the serum levels of the parathormon of this patient are, are completely normalized. I said, impossible. I just performed a biopsy, just two, two passes very fast and nothing, nothing strange. He, he said, please check, my, pe check the patient because uh, we have to understand why. I checked the patient, I checked the lesion, and I saw that inside this big uh, mass, uh, an, a, an intra, intraglandular hematoma developed. Probably this caused the mechanical uh, the compression of the uh, hyperfunctioning parenchyma, and this caused the decrease of parathormone. So we, we studied a little bit the situation. So with a simple biopsy, we had been able to achieve a good, even though transitory, uh, therapeutic result. So the patient was not so well indicated for surgery because of her, he was a woman, because of her bad conditions. And we started thinking how to use it, how to, to, to use the, our experience. So we went back to the literature and we saw that in some uh, areas, in some centers, they used to inject ethanol, 95% uh, ethanol, into uh, renal cysts, into liver cysts, to cause the sclerosis of the walls. And we said, here we have a lesion, extremely vascularized. Uh, we cannot operate. Uh, we, we could try to inject some ethanol and see what occurs. So we called back the patient and we asked, are you, are, are you available to receive this kind of treatment? And the patient was very kind and she said, why not? I'm available, just not, even now, if you like. Uh, how many patients have you treated so far? And we said, uh, not so many, but approximately how many? The one we, who will be after you will be the second. So I will be the first? Yeah, uh, yes, in our experience, yes. But uh, are there many, many cases uh, treated in the world for, in this way? We said, probably no. So I, I am the first patient in the world, probably. It was February 1982. And I said, uh, probably yes, but if you refuse, uh, we, we stop immediately. Uh, and she said, <laughs> she, she laughed a little bit and she said, um, give me uh, at least 24 hours before deciding, then I will be back. The next day, she came back and said, I am available. So we started injecting slowly this uh, amount of ethanol with a look, just a simple local anesthesia. We performed in, in uh, one week two injections, and at the end, incredibly, the patient came back to a normal, normal parathyroid function. This was probably, uh, probably uh, I, would, I would say surely, certainly, the very first ablation ever performed in the world of a, of a solid tumor and which uh, it, it opened the way to further uh, possibilities, further treatments, as you know. The idea to inject ethanol was not only due to the hypervascularity, but also to the fact that parathyroidinomas, as you know, have a capsule and the capsule allows ethanol to remain inside an nodule, avoiding the possible dangerous diffusion into the perilesional tissues. So starting from this point, this was the first case, and we collect, started collecting cases of parathyroid tumors treated with ethanol. That is amazing. How, how did you know that the ethanol would stay within the capsule? Oh, because, because of the visi direct visibility with ultrasound, this is the advantage of using ultrasound. You, you can control the position of the needle, as you know, but you can also control very easily when you inject something liquid into a solid where the liquid goes. So our idea was to inject very, very, very slowly in order to avoid uh, extravasations out. And this was achieved and the result was uh, extraordinary. The patient was extremely glad for that because uh, he spared surgery. So. Very interesting, Gigi. Why do you think this procedure with the parathyroid injections, is it now a standard in some places? Because, you know, we ourselves don't do it as much as we should based on all this experience from 40 years ago. 
<laughs> first of all, in, the, in recent years, uh, some uh, drugs uh, came out uh, particularly useful for uh, the therapy, medical treatment of parathyroid patients. But secondly, also the sur surgery of parathyroid glands improved significantly. So the indications nowadays for a local interventional treatment of parathyroid tumors is definitely decreased. But uh, it, first of all, it was historically very important. And uh, nowadays, it, when it is performed, it is partly replaced by thermal ablation of parathyroid tumors using the very fine uh, uh, electrodes, RF electrodes, which nowadays are available. Uh, nowadays, ethanol injection of parathyroid tumors is no longer performed so much in the world. But again, it was historically of crucial importance for the future of interventional oncology. Very interesting. Very interesting. So how did the, how did the jump to liver cancer begin? And what, how, what was the origin of that you know, major leap from this indication to applying it for liver cancer? First of all, we thought uh, about other possible uh, lesions in our body, which could uh, uh, be similar to parathyroid tumors. And one of them was hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, as you know, is a hypervascular lesion, particularly in arterial phase. And um, HCs, which are in the range of two centimeters maximum, are usually capsulated. So they could be ideally a new field of application for ethanol injection. But at that time, I had the, the great, great, great fortune to be a close, close friend of Tito Livraghi. Tito Livraghi, who, was, uh, who is 10 years uh, older than I am, uh, in those years started a protocol of uh, U.S. guided injection of various uh, chemotherapeutic agents according to the different tumor histology, into neoplasmas of the liver, of the pancreas, of the lungs, with the relatively good uh, responses, 60-70% of the cases, in patients previously undergone unsuccessful systemic chemo. Tito um, spoke to me and uh, he asked me regarding ethanol par parathyroid tumors. I said, it works, seems to work very well. So he started just one year after our, our first case, injecting ethanol into small hepatocellular carcinomas. And together with Tito, some, also some other Japanese author, authors started with excellent results. And Tito, I was the author of the first paper on uh, uh, ethanol, in, ethanol injection of parathyroid tumors in 1985 in radiology. And in the following year, 1986, Tito Livraghi was the author of the very first paper ever published in the world in radiology uh, in, uh, for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinomas with uh, ethanol. And just to, to mention an unusual situation, when we presented our results at two RSNA meetings in 1985 and 1986, we had a sort of aggression by journalists, not only scientific journalists, but also journalists of uh, conventional journals, for example, New York Times and other important American journals, interviewing us for the success of this uh, not expensive, I mean, very cheap therapy of a very important disease, hepatocellular carcinoma. That's also amazing. And I think that is, you know, very important because both of your work, his work and your, your work in treating hepatocellular carcinoma with ethanol is still kind of a benchmark for any therapy that is local, local or local regional. I think that this is a very important point that seems to not be as prominent these days. Do you agree? Absolutely. Uh, particularly, Steve, when we refer to, for example, poor countries where they cannot afford buying uh, expensive uh, RFA machines, uh, microwave machines, uh, uh, but they have a very high incidence of hepatocellular carcinomas. If they learn using ethanol injection, very cheap modality, they can get very good results uh, in, in, in conditions in conditions of life which are not similar to ours. We are, we, are, we are more lucky than them in most countries. How did, in this field, because this was a revolutionary 
treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma. How did you pair the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma with other things about hepatocellular carcinoma, like surveillance and the importance of continuous imaging over time? How did you make all those distinctions and how did you bring it together? We studied at the beginning how how to follow up these patients uh, with imaging, with ultrasound, with contrast enhanced CT. And uh, uh, before, uh, before uh, publishing papers regarding that, uh, we studied a lot. And finally, we found a good balance between uh, uh, the uh, in injection of ethanol, the control on time, and so on. And uh, finally, we started publishing uh, papers which had a great, tremendous, uh, tremendous success. Unfortunately, unfortunately, when we tried to treat relatively larger hepatocellular carcinomas, larger than 2.5 cm, or metastasis, for example, colorectal metastasis, we were not so successful because ethanol, as you know, does not satisfy all the needs of this type of lesions. First of all, hepatocellular carcinomas relatively larger, have very frequently microsatellites all around. Ethanol remains inside the tumor. So you can treat the tumor, but you cannot prevent for the formation of recurrences, of local recurrences just at the periphery of the lesion. Colorectal metastasis, or in general, all the metastases do not have capsule. So the injection of ethanol was not successful because ethanol moved far away from the, from the, from the lesion and the local uh, result was really very poor. So we understood that within uh, three, four, five years uh, that with, with ethanol, we should have been limited to treat only lesions, hypervascular and capsulated, nothing else. And this was a limit, of course. It's amazing that you were able to bring in a series of interesting events and scientific curiosity just basically launch a field. And, you know, as pioneers in this field, did you encounter only positive reactions or did you also have negative reactions? Was there a lot of criticism or how did you face those problems when, when faced with um, some skepticism or did you have to encounter any skepticism? We encountered a lot of criticism, particularly by surgeons. Uh, we had, uh, I would say, some uh, dis discussions, sometimes uh, even fights during meetings, uh, during uh, congresses, uh, particularly uh, with uh, surgeons. And just to, to mention a very funny story, uh, one day there was a big meeting on uh, on hepatocellular carcinoma in Bologna, uh, mid middle of Italy, uh, with people coming from Japan, from United States, from all all over Europe, and so on. And this very famous uh, Japanese surgeon, very famous, uh, presented the experience with uh, surgery um, just after our talk regarding ethanol injection. At the end of this uh, long uh, presentation, the, uh, the chairman of the session asked uh, him, the Japanese, uh, but if you had in your liver a small hepatocellular carcinoma, would you be treated with surgery or with uh, um, uh, ethanol injection? And incredibly, for all the people around, there were probably six or 700 people in the room, he said, for sure, with ethanol, not with surgery. This was, <laughs> this was that, a great day. That, that is amazing. <laughs> and and had, he, had, had you known him previously or did he know your work? Or is it because they were doing it in Japan also? No, because, because I mean, uh, we knew him very well. He was, he was known all, all over the world. But at that time, also, we were well known in the world. So we, know, we knew each other very well. But he was very honest because after presenting the tremendous success of uh, liver surgery, liver resections, finally he said, if I had an hepatocellular carcinoma, small, of course, small lesion, I would rather be uh, uh, treated with ethanol than with surgery. And you can imagine the reactions of the room. <laughs> Incredible. This was a very strange story. In other situations, uh, much worse. Uh, we had very bad discussions sometimes, uh, especially with, again, with surgeons, uh, 
who tried to defend their, their practice of surgery, even in situations which were not easy to be defended. Uh, but, uh, you know, every time, I think it's common in the medical world to have some, let's say, fights when you introduce something new. One day, a famous, famous, famous Italian surgeon, surgeon asked me in front of 600 people, all surgeons, but if you go, if you go on like that, what will, will we do in our future? And I said, I don't care. It is your life. You have to decide what to do. My father was a radiologist, but if today I, uh, I was working like my father 20 or 30 years ago, nobody would come, would come to me. So you have to update your activity. If something changes, you have to change, definitely. You can imagine again the reactions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, you know, some of these fights have not uh, really changed. I mean, some of, some of this, some of this still persists and it's, you know, it's a very, these are, these are very instructive stories. It's almost like you should write a book about all these changes and how you introduce change and, and, and so on. How did you, how did you, how did you teach others or how did others learn so that you developed a community in Italy and around the world for these techniques? Did people come to learn from you or did you go elsewhere? Uh, both, both situations. Uh, we organized uh, for many, many years courses in the in our two hospitals uh, in Vimercate, where Tito were, was working. Uh, Vimercate is the the opposite part of Milan, uh, sixty kilometers far from from Busta, where I live. And uh, and Busta, we organized a lot of small courses, very frequent, but small for a limited number of people, not more than six, seven, eight people, in order that they could learn. To also to treat cases, not only to see us treating. Secondly, we started organizing meetings at that time called image-guided therapies of oncologic diseases. And the very first was in Milan in 1994. Uh, it, was, it is remembered, still remembered, as the very first meeting dedicated to what will be uh, uh, in, in, in the next year will be called the, called the interventional oncology. But at that time, the name interventional oncology was not yet uh, invented. Uh, so um, courses, meetings, and publications. These were the, the modalities we used, and they were fruitful at the end. Took time, but they were fruitful. Gigi, this is very interesting in terms of surgical adoption. What about adoption in other fields of radiology, like interventional radiology with regards to other therapies like transarterial chemoembolization for liver cancer treatment? Oh, this is a very, a very tricky uh, question because uh, um, in parallel with the development of uh, percutaneous treatments, uh, for, started with ethanol injection and then moved to, as you know, from to radiofrequency, microwaves, and so on, also the situation of intravascular therapies uh, uh, went on and uh, improved uh, in, in many centers. Um, and uh, they started being in competition for, uh, for the same type of lesions, for, uh, for hypervascular lesions, particularly, again, hepatocellular carcinomas, but also, for example, metastasis from neuroendocrine tumors, which are hypervascular, as you know, and so um, we were in, in, in some little competition, but I have to say that the competition from, this is my experience, uh, between radiologists performing intravascular therapies and radiologists performing percutaneous ablations was not so, so critical. We tried, we tried to, to manage the situation and we try to say uh, that uh, if you have a, 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 particular, a particularly great experience in intravascular procedures, go on with those if they work. If you have um, greater experience for percutaneous uh, ultrasound guided or CT guided procedures, go on with that. In some cases, as you know, we, we found also a combination nowadays in many situations of big lesions uh, very often we use both modalities. For example, we start with uh, intravascular treatment and then we finish the treatment with percutaneous ablation, for example. So the competition in this, between these two groups was not so 
how can I say, it was not so fighting as the competition between uh, surgical treatments and uh, ablations, definitely. Great, great. Yeah, the, the combinations and the permutations of these technologies are incredible and, you know, give us, give us a lot of hope for all sorts of different applications. How did you make the transition from ethanol to thermal techniques? How did that happen? This was, again, another, um, I would say, relatively occasional situations, a situation. When we presented our results um, with ethanol at the RSNA, we met in 1993, uh, Tito Olivraghi and I met the group of uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, led by Peter Mueller, particularly formed by Professor uh, Nahum Goldberg, now working in Jerusalem, and Dr. Scott Gazelle. They were uh, experimenting in animals, only in animals, the very initial prototypes of the so-called uh, so -called cool tip radio frequency, which seemed to be very promising, but they could not test it in humans. They approached us, uh, very, very, very glad of, of meeting us, of knowing our experiences. And they said, would you be available to test in humans uh, radio frequency uh, in, in Italy? At that time, uh, fortunately for us, uh, the FDA was already existing in US, and this was the main limitation for them. While in, in Europe, particularly in Italy, we, uh, we had the fewer limitations. We presented our protocol to our ethics committee uh, and they relied on the, on the preliminary work on animals performed in America. And in 1995, we performed in Busto one day and in Vimercata the next day, the very first treatments in the world for hepatocellular carcinoma with cool tip radio frequency. And the subsequent years in 1996, the first treatment for colorectal metastasis with uh, cool tip radio frequency. Again, uh, we were the starters of these new procedures. And as you know, cool tip radio frequency is still used, is still in use in many, many centers, and it works. So we were glad to have been also the pioneers of that. And when we published a paper comparing ethanol and uh, RFA, uh, this paper had an incredible number of citations. It, will, it is one of the, probably the most cited paper uh, in interventional oncology still today. It had uh, thousands of citations. It's a very, very famous paper, as, as are most of the, these pioneering works that you have published. You and Dr. Liberaghi together, you alone and you, Dr. Liberaghi, together. What do you think are the most important things that you've accomplished in interventional oncology? I mean, this term has now been here for at least 15, more than 15 years. And you yourself probably coined the term interventional oncology. So what do you think are the most important accomplishments and what is left to do? It is, uh, it is not, not a difficult question, this one. Uh, the the mo probably most, most important uh, accomplishment was uh, the capability to introduce in the world, in the medical world, a new modality of treatment. You, you know, there was medical oncology, there was surgical oncology, there was radiation oncology, but our therapies were, were none of them. It was a different treatment. So we started talking about interventional oncology as the fourth pillar of oncology. And at that time, this, came, uh, this idea came out uh, in uh, probably in, 20, um, in 2003, 2005, 2006. It uh, was a winning idea because uh, after some years, uh, the diffusion of this, uh, this therapies, uh, the acceptance of these therapies uh, was increased. Uh, we proposed this ther these therapies as relatively low cost treatments. Uh, relatively very, very low, um, um, how would I say, uh, with a very low incidence of uh, major complications, 1%, 1.5%, much lower than surgical complications, for example, not requiring uh, surgery, not requiring long admissions at the hospitals and so on. So these were, in my opinion, important accomplishments. The, the negative point, which is still existing, 
is that uh, it was very difficult to be able to achieve and publish guidelines. Incredibly, in the year 2022, where are we now? We have nowadays guidelines of hepatocellular carcinomas treated, including also ablations, some initial guidelines regarding colorectal meds, some initial guidelines, guidelines describing introducing renal cell carcinomas treated with ablation, and uh, probably not more, not 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 many others, because the introduction or introduction of these guidelines requires long times. In my opinion, longer than needed. But you know, we cannot uh, we cannot do whatever we like in our in our life, as you know. Yeah, I mean, what you've started now is kind of the standard of care for so many diseases. Where you know, we are using it, using it, it, of course, in the liver, in the lung, in the kidney, in thyroid, in parathyroid, in gynecologic oncology, in prostate, in musculoskeletal, all sorts of indications that are oncologic and non-oncologic. So, you know, you've started something that's really taken on a life of its own in so many different areas and so many different conditions and helped so many people in so many situations. So I think that is an amazing, amazing story. And, you know, I think really you should write a book or something about it, Gigi. What are you, <laughs> what are you most excited about in the future? As you look to the future, the next 10 years, 20 years, what are you excited about? This is a very a great question. First of all, in, in the future, in, in general, I foresee a greater and greater and greater diffusion of this kind of modalities, even in small hospitals, in small centers, in small, in poor countries. Uh, I had the opportunity to give a conference uh, recently to a group of African countries, and they were astonished because they said, we can do that. Uh, we, can, we can study, we can buy this these simple machines, and we can perform that. This is, in my opinion, a very important social future of our uh, of our technologies, of our uh, therapies. Technically, technically, I think that uh, we have a great uh, amount of different therapies: uh, radiofrequency, microwaves, uh, electroporation. Probably also some new uh, new therapies like histotripsy, which is very promising extremely promising for the future. We have in parallel a great development of guidance modalities. Robots are uh, currently are not so diffused and they are, are expensive, but uh, they will become probably more and more used and they will be more and more useful to teach young people to use. You know, young people, uh, I think it's common, it's a common idea, are very, very fast in learning to use uh, technology. So these kind of systems will have a great future, in my opinion. Uh, we have another possibility of augmented reality. I had, I have the fortune to be, to have been the first person in the world testing augmented reality for the guidance of ablations. And it is fascinating, Steve. It allows to, to reach targets, uh, even in difficult locations, very easily. Also by people with a very, very limited experience. Just to mention, one day we had a test in, at Humanitas. Uh, we had a test on a cadaver, not a real patient, with several small metastases, very difficult, very complicated. There was a young guy close to me, not yet specialized in diagnostic radiology, who said, may I try? He had never seen, he had never used, uh, never performed even a biopsy in his life, and he had never seen augmented reality uh, system. We, it took uh, 10 minutes for me to explain to him how to use it. At the end, he took the needle and he reached the metastasis, one of these difficult metastases, in the same time token, to, taken by me to reach after 43 years of experience to, to get the same target. This was extremely important. This is fascinating because we have to push 
uh, young people to be interested in this kind of therapies, to develop these therapies, because if we started, somebody else has to continue and has to improve these therapies in the future. This is my, my idea. In, and to conclude, also the combination therapies will be extremely important, not only combination with chemotherapy, but also with the immunotherapy, which is, in, is starting is starting very, uh, very well. And in the near future, in my opinion, the combination of immuno and ablation will give us great, great results. Not for me, because my, my career is finishing, but for all our patients. Well, you know, we stand on your shoulders and we all have very good and fulfilling careers in ablation, treating lots of patients, but it really it's all in no small part thanks to what you and Tito started all those years ago. So I hope this has given our listeners some perspective on, you know, where we've come and where we're going in this very exciting field. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.